Hi, before we get started with the episode, we just wanted to point you in the direction of the social accounts we've set up for the show to help you guys engage with us and communicate and get involved with our show. You can email us at can'tdisappointpodcast at gmail.com. Emailing us will really be the best way to talk to us directly and conversate with us on air during the show. Also, be sure to like You Can't Disappoint a Podcast on Facebook. And you can also follow us on Instagram at Can't Disappoint Podcast and Twitter at You Can't Disappod. That's Disappod like Disappoint. So there's one S and two P's. Well, thanks for tuning in and let's kick off the episode. Here we go. <laughs> Action. Poop, 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 poop. Hey, Britta. Your call got me thinking, and thinking got me drinking. Stop. That was terrible. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. Another week. We're still here. We haven't given up yet. How are you doing? What's up? You know, I was thinking, and thinking got me drinking. <laughs> oh my god. I think that that should be a country song. Welcome to the show, everyone. I, as always, am one of your two gracious hosts. My name is, of course, Steven. Mm. Boo. And welcome to You Can't Disappoint, a podcast. Hi, I'm, I'm Steven, <laughs> and this is You Can't Disappoint, a podcast, with your host... <laughs> <laughs> Zach and Steven. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Shout out to communities on Twitter. Thank you for everything you do to keep the community community together. Go check them out on Twitter. Thanks for checking us out because of them. You know the deal. Thanks for listening to the show. Write us a review if you have the time. Thanks for coming aboard. How are you, Steven? I'm doing great. I want to give like an extra bonus shout out to oh. the Twitter community in general. I feel like people have been really um, active and interactive lately. And yeah, yesterday and, was a really cool. fun Twitter day. As a super duper, I had fun yesterday. Yeah, cool stuff. Follow us on Twitter if you're not already. At you can't disappod. That's probably the social media platform we have the most fun on. But Absolutely. you can follow us everywhere. Yeah, we're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. <laughs> 4chan uh, <laughs> 2chan uh, google plus <laughs> disney um, minus we're on all kinds of message boards but you should probably stay away from those yeah our tumblr is pretty <laughs> racy welcome to the show steven did you uh watch anything this week listen to anything of me? um let's see i unfortunately did you I did watch not... anything with real people uh before no. this episode of community since the last episode of community no, but I'm planning on watching Umbrella Academy soon. I haven't watched any of it, but I feel like I need to. Yeah, I've heard it's good. I have mostly been watching Black Clover this week. Really solid show. Check it out if you're into things like Naruto. I also moved this weekend, so I'm in a new new location, which I'm sure really uh, affects the the video viewers. <laughs> yeah, he's moved from my front room closet to my <laughs> kitchen pantry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, upgrade, how's, how's downgrade, you decide. There, yeah, um, it's a little warmer, a little less space, but yeah. I have a lot more snacks and don't, a little bit more oxygen. Don't fucking touch my snacks. <laughs> the the cat attacks me a little bit less in the night. I don't have a cat. <laughs> what's what's been attacking you in the night? Are you, was it just Lily? Is that what that was? Everyone, why don't we just dive right into things, because we have a lot to get through in this first part of the episode. We're here today to talk about episode 16 of season one, Communication Studies, um, which was written by Chris McKenna, who wrote a total of eight episodes throughout the series. He wrote an episode at least in every season, except for season four. Uh, he left when Dan left. He and Dan are pretty intense uh, uh, like co-collaborators that they met through Chris McKenna becoming a writer of this show. He, this was his first writing credit. He also wrote in the future The Art of Discourse, Anthropology 101, Conspiracy Theories and Interior Design, which is considered one of the best episodes, Paradigms of Human Memory, which is one of my favorites, Remedial Chaos Theory, which is one of the best episodes of the entire series, 
Yeah. Um, he also did Digital Exploration of Interior Design. He wrote the Season 5 premiere Repilot with Dan Harmon, the Season 6 premiere Ladders with Dan Harmon, and the series finale Emotional Consequences of Broadcast Television, which I love more and more every time I come around and watch it. He wrote that with Dan Harmon as well. Wow. So great track record. Absolutely, and, and I think it shines through in this episode. Yeah, and it was directed by Adam Davidson, who also has quite the track record. He previously directed Comparative Religion, and he goes on to direct The Science of Illusion, The Art of Discourse, Conspiracy Theories and Interior Design, Curriculum Unavailable, and Digital Estate Planning. Wow. <laughs> and it originally aired February 11th, 2010. Before we give away our opinions, let's do our questions. Let's do some trivia, friends. Okie dokie. Um, I'll start this week. I have three questions for you. Okay. As per the norm, I feel like if I have... I don't want to embarrass myself anymore by having a question that is not anywhere near as hard as apparently the the real fans of this show. Well, yeah, and uh, also <laughs> that's become so much more the heart of our trivia to yeah. where I want to make sure we have ample time to take a look at the work people have been doing for us. Yeah, it's really great. Yeah, yeah Eventually awesome. we're going to phase out us from the podcast altogether. It's going to be great. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, what names... Does Slater call Britta at the beginning of the episode? Okay. Mistakenly, um, when she's like, what's her name? I know it's Beetlejuice. Mm-hmm. But the first two are escaping me. Can you point me in the direction in any way? Um, they both start with B and are two that. syllables. Nah, I don't think I have it at this point in time. Ah. But I know it's Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice is the third one. It's showtime. Yeah. It's definitely the most memorable. Yeah. Um, the first two were bitter and butter. Bitter, butter, Beetlejuice. Well, you know the Beetlejuice bit is that this is the first of three times throughout the series community that they say Beetlejuice. <laughs> well, I'm back. I feel real good about myself. You know what I mean? And the third really? time they say his name, you can see Beetlejuice appear in the background. I never knew that. That's hilarious. Yeah, it happens once each season, and then in season three, when we we'll, when we get there, we'll be sure to point it out. Beetlejuice walks through the background when someone says it in a Halloween episode. That's pretty freaking awesome. What a great long-term Arrested Development level joke. Yeah, you know? I know that is definitely Arrested Development level. All right, who is Pierce's Valentine gift from allegedly? Um, Danielle from his marketing class. Yeah. I like how Pierce is like, we're sleeping together. (laughs) We're sleeping together. (laughs) All right, your turn. (laughs) All right, this is a a bit of a toughie. What movie poster is in the background of the Breakfast Club dancing scene? Oh, goodness. When they're on the table. I don't think I know this one, Stephen. Okay, this was a fun one. um, And and a a callback, if you will, to the last episode. Was it Kick Puncher? Kick Splasher. (laughs) Oh, so a future <laughs> installment. In the, I like to in the think franchise. that it's a like a beach movie. Well, yeah, of course. For, yeah, for you know, once you've puncher. done three or four kick punchers, you kind of stretch for, <laughs> for new ideas. Yeah. <laughs> what happened at Jeff's law firm retreat at Disney World? Ooh, um, he got so drunk mm-hmm. that like you do. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, I've never been to Disney World, but apparently there's this thing called drinking around the world, and I'd like to do it. Answer the question, then I'll comment. <laughs> um, okay, so he got drunk and then fought, like, the mechanical Benjamin Franklin. Perfect. Yeah, I went to Disney World in February, right before all the coronavirus stuff happened, and yeah. it was the perfect time to go. So Disney World has four complete theme parks, one of which is Epcot. Mm-hmm. Um, Epcot has some cool rides, but enough that you can do pretty quickly. Like, there's only a couple you have to do. The big draw at Epcot is something called the World Showcase, where there's, like, pavilions for, I think there's, like, 11 or 12 of them like different countries oh wow and as you're walking around this big circle it's like you're taking a couple steps through each country and there are a few snack restaurant places um there's like shops there's like street performers all kinds of stuff and you can get like a like an authentic alcoholic beverage from each country so a lot of people will drink around the world and they'll go country hopping and try to have a drink from each of the countries that's awesome or like eat around the world and try a bunch of authentic food we didn't quite do all of them, but we ate at a Canadian steakhouse that was amazing, Ooh. and we had quite a few good drinks. The Italy drink was really good. Have you ever had limoncello? Yes. It was like limoncello and like 
like some like a sparkling wine or a champagne or something mixed oh, together. Oh wow, it was that very sounds tasty. yummy. Yeah. Next question. Oh, it's me. Yeah. All right. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, you're in this too, buddy. Oh crap. Oh uh, dang it. Brit is in this one. <laughs> what actor does Abed say Scorsese drank with? De Niro. Locking Correct. it in. Boom. I don't think that was for directing. I don't. I just think Scorsese and De Niro were probably the drinking type. Back in yeah. Day. <laughs> was that your last question? It was. So I only really got that one right. You've gotten both of mine right so far. I I kind of went a little easy. I was just to, to spoil it. I enjoyed this episode quite a bit. I did so too. So I was just kind of watching it for the most part. I uh, actually watched this one, which is why I'm getting them right. <laughs> Your last question is, and I'm sure you'll get this one right as well, what size is Pierce's dress? <laughs> it was a 14. Yeah, but he wishes... He wants to be a 12. <laughs> yeah, he wants to be a 12. But you're kidding yourself, Pierce. It's never going to happen. Sorry, no. buddy. Those days are past. So we're going to segue <laughs> into the listener questions. I'm going to open us up with an email that's a little bit separate from trivia questions. Okay. Uh, we've got a write-in from the people over at Communities, who we love very much. Uh, they say hi guys questions this is matt he said these are questions that are not so much trivia questions they're opinion questions so we've got this one i'll have to speak for he says do you prefer the extended version over the tv version so yeah to mention this episode there is an extended version of it the episode that's streaming on most services is 21 minutes and some change uh the dvd and i don't know if anywhere else features an extended version of producer's cut is what it says that's a full like five or six minutes longer and i watched them both and this is my first time seeing the longer version and it was different than what i expected it was really clear what footage was added in and what was part of the episode it like looked different Mm. so it kind of was like deleted scenes being put in and it was mostly just like extra lines and scenes so there were a few funny jokes but there wasn't anything earth shattering that made me definitively like that version better even if it was interesting to see some of the stuff that uh ended up on the cutting room floor the funniest bit was in the beginning when the human being is in the study room uh Mm -hmm. pierce is like you know there's a rumor going around campus that that's abed and they (laughs) look around the table and abed's not there but then he pops up from underneath the table and he's like fool you guys wasn't me (laughs) so there's my answer for that matt second one uh, he says, and I'll let you tackle this one first. Uh, what are your Slater positions? How do you feel about Slater? <laughs> you know, my uh, Slater positions, unfortunately, are a little different than Jeff's. But uh, but I like Slater. I'm 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 pro Slater. I mean, I get that their relationship maybe can't last forever, and you know, obviously, spoiler alert, it doesn't. But I like Slater. You're f- kidding me. You're kidding me. Sorry. Slater's not Endgame? Come on. No. Huh. Yeah, I like Slater. I think I like her a little bit less in this episode than the previous one she was in. Agreed. Um, There's not a lot to the character, really. She's just kind of the girl that Jeff's dating right now. And I think they could have done a lot more with her than what they did, but they chose not to, which is fine. And it makes what there is of her a little bit less compelling, because I think she's only in another episode or two. Yeah. So I would say, like... Six out of ten on Slater, but I think she's a really great first love interest for Jeff, rather than it be someone in the study group. Okay, I'll 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 throw a solid seven. Okay, we'll talk mm-hmm. more about Slater as we go through this episode. Their final question, and this one, I looked at this email ahead of time because of the type of question I typically don't with these. Uh, yeah. Because I had to look back. I didn't even remember the other one. Uh, they ask, "What is your favorite Valentine's Day episode?" And the Valentine's Day episodes have never stuck out to me like the Christmas and Halloween ones do, where I can pretty much come up with all of them. There's one other Valentine's Day episode. It's in season two. It's the one where I believe Choi and Abed have the same date at a dance. Uh... And they, like, both try to impress her, and she decides at the end who she wants to date. And it's also the one where Britta has a lesbian friend, Mm -hmm. and she goes to the dance with her, like, as a joke, but the line becomes weird. I Yeah remember that one fondly but i think i might prefer this one yeah i'm gonna go with this one too i don't remember the other one like i i remember it but we'll see when we get there i'll be able to give a definitive answer Mm -hmm. you know this time next season yeah so yeah thanks matt for that uh for that conversation starter let us know what you think of those questions and everybody let us know what you think as we segue into steven's uh chat with us for the week 
All right, so I have a few questions. emails for us this week, so we're going to jump right in. Jump um, the first one, <laughs> the first one uh, is from Danny. Hi, Danny. It says, hi, Zach and Steven. What's Happy up? Valentine's Day What's episode up? to y'all. <laughs> oh, no. Here are my questions for this episode. Oh, I knew this was coming. I, I, this was almost one of my questions. Uh-oh. Can we hear an impression of what the rooster says in Spanish? I am willing to do it, but this does sound like more of a Steven thing. <laughs> do you feel like you've got one in the, at the ready? Sure. So why don't you go first? I'll bring us. I can't get in that high of a screechy register. I do live in an apartment building with other people <laughs> nearby, so I'm sorry to my neighbors who I tend to dislike. <laughs> Chikorichi! 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 Okay, Richard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna scoot back a little bit from my microphone. Just like I should have. I, I, okay. <clears throat> In English, the rooster says. Oh man. Cockadoodle do. In Spanish, what is it? El garo, I think, says. Kikiriki! 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 <laughs> All right, Danny, you'll have to let us know if we got that question right or not. <laughs> we did our best. <laughs> That's the tagline of the series. You can't disappoint a podcast. We did our best. I thought you meant kikiriki. <laughs> uh, the community wiki page listed that Chang impression of a rooster as a Arrested Development homage. I don't know if it was on purpose, but yeah. it definitely reminds of the chicken dance. Yeah, it does. A toodaloodaloo, a toodaloodaloo, caca, a caca, cha, chi cha, chi cha, caca, What's the one that they finally showed in the fourth season? It was George Michael. Yeah, and his is just like he stands up and puts his hands up and he's like cluck, 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 cluck. Come on, moving on. All right. Oh, okay. You had this one. What was the name of Pierce's fake Valentine? Danielle. Okay, Danielle from marketing class. Apparently, mm-hmm. they're sleeping together. Yeah. Ooh, good for him. Um, okay, here we go. Mention three activities Jeff and Abed do during the drinking scene. They play beer pong with, like, a punch bowl. Mm-hmm. They also did some breakfast club dancing. And Jeff did push-ups while Abed wore a luchador mask. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I really am curious to know that. what was going on there. Can you? Do you have another one? <laughs> um, they ordered a pizza. Yeah, they sure did, and made a good, a good friend out of the pizza guy it appears they did i really hope that he comes back <laughs> what else we got <laughs> all right um now i i do know this one how much are the human beings kisses according to his kissing booth at the dance okay well since you're so sure about it what is it well it originally says 25 cents but then that's crossed out and it <laughs> says free i didn't see that that's funny <laughs> i would have paid 25 cents for a smooch it's not like I it's real lip to lip contact yeah yeah it's through a, a burlap nylon and, and a, magic marker and magic marker <laughs> oh okay what's the ice cream flavor slater picked for law and order night chubby hubby chubby hubby which i've never had i haven't either i, I do uh, like ben and jerry's and i like to sample sorry i i'm with this thing and i keep dropping it uh, you know what i mean I, do you have to like keep your hands busy do you like f- with something while you re- record ever you know exactly what i'm doing for the entirety of this recording what's the question again <laughs> <laughs> what I, I, oh you got it chubby chubby hubby yeah <laughs> uh, she said it's been so fun rewatching uh, and hearing you guys every week definitely in my top three quarantine act- activities much love danny well thank you danny thanks for always uh Coming in clutch with the questions, I wish I could say that doing this podcast was in my top three quarantine Yeah, uh, it's not even close. <laughs> no, it, it barely cracks the top 20, and I don't do much. Yeah, I think I do about, like, eight things, and this is very clearly number nine. Of course I'm kidding. I, I love doing it, and I love you guys getting involved. What we got next? Who else wrote it this All week? right, next email here is from Anorak07. Um, oh, Anorak07? Says, I think we went to high school together. Oh, yeah. He was in my shop class. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take shop. Hey, guys. I love your podcast, and I've heard and enjoyed every episode. The last one, Romantic Expressionism, was one of my absolute favorites. Nice. 
Nice, thank you. Also, I have to say, I'm not a native speaker. I'm actually from Germany, so please don't mind mistakes in my writing. Everything looks great so oh, far. That's why he likes the podcast <laughs> that's, so that much. He meant to say I hated There's it There's some lapse in understanding. <laughs> he, he picks up... Yeah, he doesn't pick up some of the nonsense that we throw out. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Um, but he says, well, I have three <laughs> trivia questions for you. Okay. Um, the first one is, which title does Abed come up with when he tries to remember the title of The Breakfast Club? Oh. And he says, I, I know that was an easy one, but I don't know if I remember it. <laughs> he describes the movie, he's like kids in detention. Does he give a title? I think he gives a guess. The other thing I remember is him trying to come up with Molly, Molly Ringwald. Ringwald's name, and he's like, Martha, Mary, Molly Ringworm. Yeah. But I don't remember a fake title. Oh, we'll have to see when we get to it. We're going to remember this one for you, Anorak07. I make no promises, Mr. <laughs> 07, but, or Miss 07. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I assumed. Um, what else we got? Okay, name three things that Jeff offers to get for Britta. What? Yeah, I don't know. Um. Yeah, I don't know, man. Oh, I'm stumped. We That's have to see. vague enough that it, it's not even taking me to a certain part of the episode. I know, so, um, gosh, so I guess we'll see. 0 for 2. You are just okay. bragging about how you watched this one. You so clearly didn't, and neither did I. <laughs> I, I thought watched... we were doing Total Drama Island this time, so I've, I've been Wait, watching Wait, we're not? <laughs> All right, any more from... Uh, Yeah, we got one more. What does okay. the heart say on the Luis Guzman statue? Oh, At the very beginning shoot. of the episode, it says... I did see this one, mm-hmm. and I read it. Yep. But that was like 40 minutes ago. Yeah, you know? it says, be mine. I do okay. remember this one. I knew it was like a conversation heart. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay well, he thanks says, for those so questions. that's it, guys. It would be amazing to be part of the podcast. Keep definitely up with that. Thank you for listening, and you keep definitely up with listening and writing in. We love to hear from you. Glad to hear that, you know, we're reaching people across the seas. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, dude. I know it'd be really great to be a part of the podcast, but we just don't have time to read every email we get every week. So this is going to end up on the cutting room floor. Better luck next time. Man, really sucks. Love from America. Seems like a nice, nice, nice friend. Thanks for writing in, dude. I'm glad you're enjoying the show. And yeah, thanks for being a part of it. Next. All right. Um, And our third, I guess fourth email this week um, is from our good friend MJ. He says, hey, guys, thanks for another fun discussion this week on romantic expressionism. I have to agree with you guys about this episode being a step down in quality, but there were also some iconic moments smattered throughout the episode, like the awkward table scene and Vaughn's song to Annie. They can't all be winners, I guess. Steven not liking the awkward table scene still doesn't set right with me. I think that's one of the great moments of the whole series. Well, you don't Awkward doesn't mean not funny. No Hope comment. y'all enjoy my trivia around this week. Communication studies we'll is not one of my favorite episodes. It's very sitcom-y. But I'm sure y'all would have plenty of fun discussions about it. We'll see. Let's hope. Here's to hoping. Right. Mm-hmm. What you got for us, MJ? It's All so right. nice that MJ has time to write us these emails in between being Spider-Man's girlfriend. <laughs> it's. I really respect it. Uh, okay, MJ's trivia round. Week quattro. I added huh. the quattro. It's just the the number four um one why did the registrar's office leave a message in jeff's cell phone in the beginning of the episode because he was trying to pay for his tuition with air air i can't talk airline miles <laughs> which absolutely seems like something track would do it's yeah like, i've got like fifty thousand miles on delta i'm not going anywhere you can take those <laughs> i don't have cash i just have this faucet <laughs> and i've given away my lexus three times already so this is all i have <laughs> Oh, God. All right. Number two, the call of what animal was Chang teaching the class in Spanish before he was interrupted by the Cupid, Cupid being, the rooster? And he said, bonus points if we imitate on air. Been there, done that, Haas. We're yeah, old pros. I'm not doing it again. Nope. <laughs> All right. Number three, what was the name of the fake lady who Pierce claimed sent him a Valentine's Day gift? We answered that one as well. All right. Danielle in the house. Number four. <laughs> What did what story did Jeff tell to Britta to make her feel less embarrassed about the message she left to Jeff? And that would be your Disneyland question about Benjamin Franklin. We're just all so in sync this week. Yeah. 
All right, here we go. Why did Leo lose his cool during his acting session with Abed? That oh, was shoot. the little kid. Was it a juice box Chang. that he wanted a juice box? Oh, uh, I think he hated the wrong? script. Oh yeah, okay, okay. I don't know why I thought juice box. But he Probably just quit smoking, so give him a break. Yeah. yeah right? <laughs> What else is that kid in? I mean, he's been in a few other shows. They mentioned on the commentary he's the kid from Tropic Thunder. There we go. He plays on the his warlord. headshot. It says the kid from Tropic Thunder. They that's said that he's like amazing. he does not mind bragging about that. Yep, that's exactly what I knew him from. Yep. Um. All right. Number six. Describe Jeff's outfit when he woke up after his binge drinking session with Abed. Uh, is that when he's wearing two masks? He's got the Phantom of the Opera mask with the luchador mask over it. Yeah, he's got the combo. What else is he wearing? Um, does he have on some sort of cape? Yeah, he has on something. <laughs> yeah, he looked a hot mess. There is a lot of going on there. We'll look for it. I can't promise, but we'll look for it. I do remember the masks. The The reveal of the second mask was quite funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, number seven. Name the song that was playing during Chang's scene on the dance floor, which I love that scene of him dancing but i do not know the name of the song i it's like a generic boom boom pow the song yeah it sounded like a like a like a knockoff boom boom to the t of like a of like a female vocalist like singing like the fergie part (laughs) yeah (laughs) and it keeps going like i like it when the bass drop (laughs) i I like it when yeah yeah (laughs) yeah i i will gladly look for it and play it at the end of this episode if i can find it please do um okay number eight how long was the very informative voice message that jeff left to britta is it like 40 minutes 40 minutes yeah i call she, bullshit not there you will not find a voicemail box it won't let you in the world that will let you leave a message that girthy <laughs> jeff i've tried trust me yeah gillian's voicemail box <laughs> is full okay moving on all right and he says stay dizzy and a little belligerent mj we did pretty well on the written in what does that mean (laughs) he's what they say about the the because his mask has the magic marker the okay okay he's a little belligerent i never quite made out that word when i watched it okay (laughs) are you a little belligerent before we hop into the episode what were your thoughts overall we both kind of said that we enjoyed it yeah i thought it was really funny um, I think this episode was a return to not only – I don't even want to say a return to form because it's not like they left form last episode. I think this was just a step back up. Um, yeah. But I, I loved the little, you know, Donald Glover moments that were sprinkled in throughout. Yeah. I think that um, the way the characters were divided in this one I was a fan of, uh, like kind of what groups were with what. Mm. Solid. I liked it. Yeah, I liked it too. I guess I can see why MJ would have said this one is sitcom-y. What works for me in this one is that the dialogue was a lot better than the last couple weeks. Mm-hmm. To the point where a lot of the lines in the extended version worked for me less. And I was kind of glad that they cut some of them out. Because I thought yeah. the dialogue was really well in the voice of the series this, this week. Yeah, I It's agree. still the first season, so they're still kind of figuring out the voice of the show. Especially as they're... You know, they're still having writers that are writing their first episode, this being Chris McKenna's first episode. Uh, mm-hmm. Still kind of finding the overall voice of the show, and this one felt very much in it. I can see why Chris McKenna became such a huge, integral part of the show. He totally knows how to write for these characters. Yeah, totally. I think he really understands. Like Abed, especially. I think this is a good Abed episode. Oh, yeah. We'll get into it. You ready to hop in? Do you have any other opening statements? Uh, no, Let's let's dive right in. We open up with that great visual of the Luis Guzman statue in Heart Boxers. I like that they got him to hold a rose as well. It says, be mine. <laughs> yeah, top notch. I I always like when they call back to the whole Luis Guzman thing. Yeah, and then from there they cut to the Cupid being, the human being all decked out in Valentine's gear. I love how, you know, Greendale is its world, its own sandbox now. You know, all of these ridiculous images that are canon and makes sense when you see them now you know yeah it doesn't make the human being any less terrifying (laughs) that smile the like joke heath ledger joker carved in smile face uh the dean's making an announcement about how it's valentine's day week at greendale and they're going to be doing like uh the the cupid being is going to be exchanging gifts for people 
Uh, and the Dean reminds everyone, like you mentioned, but they remember his face, his magic marker on nylon. <laughs> and there's a nice little shot of him, like, bumping into somebody, and that somebody tries to, like, beat up the Cupid being. And then he, like, throws a teddy bear at him. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the human being is feisty. Uh, so Jeff and Slater are are arriving to school together. It's the one thing I do like about this relationship is since we had that episode a few weeks ago about them deciding they're a couple, if she's not in every episode since, she's always mentioned. The, yeah. Their, their relationship is real in the world, and that, that's a Which nice I like. continuity thing. You know, a lot of sitcoms, it'd be kind of, she'd disappear for episodes, and they'd never mention her. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, oh yeah, he's a girlfriend. Uh, Slater is partially in charge of the Valentine's dance this week. We get a classic Greendale dance this week. Um, oh yeah, because colleges the, certainly have you know dances all the time, especially community colleges. Yeah, and at first I think it was just like a reason for them to have events on the show all the time. Mm-hmm. Eventually, they totally did buy into that joke. Yeah, like there's the really there. I think it's in the first season towards the end where the dean like makes shirts that say all five dances for the people who showed up to all the dances. <laughs> I think it's funny. Slater suggests that Jeff invite the study group, and that's when we get, um, you know, the one of a thousand jokes on Britta's name. You know, bitter butter Beetlejuice. Mm-hmm. But the little Beetlejuice thing is very funny. We will hear Beetlejuice. You're, you're gonna be fine on the other side. Die, you're all gonna die, you're all gonna die. Another time in season two, and then we will see him when he's mentioned in season three. In a year and a half from now. God willing. <laughs> I'm surprised we made it past the first one. <laughs> Jeff is talking kind of about how, you know, he's new at being a boyfriend and he's not really sure what Valentine's Day is supposed to be, what he's supposed to do, how to do it right. He mentions advice that Britta gave him about Valentine's Day. Um,. Which which Slater takes as a comment on how Britta is not the type of person that has a date on Valentine's Day. Uh, but, but Jeff's asking her for advice. Are you the type of person, have you been in a relationship on Valentine's Day? Did you go I all have out? a couple times. Um, <laughs> Any insight there? Uh, it's fine. It's like, so the first time I had been dating her for like a month at that point, And so we like... Is this high school? Yeah, high school. Okay. We went to the other one. Actually, this is kind of a funny, awkward story, but I guess I'll tell it. Um, So I was, like, talking to a girl Mm -hmm. on Valentine's Day, and so we went on a date, and, like, I was, like, okay. I wasn't really sure, like, where things were going or, like, what she wanted out of it, but I, like, thought, I was, like, oh, well, this is the type of girl she probably wants to, like, date, not just, like, whatever. And so I, like, (laughs) asked her out. (laughs) on valentine's day and she was like um i kind of was just keeping it cool and i was like well shit that's what i wanted but i didn't know and it was really awkward and embarrassing did it work out or was that the end of converse um it wasn't quite the end but that kind of brought about the fizzling (laughs) just because it was like awkward Awkward. and i was i was getting ready to move to chicago anyway like i was deciding at the time whether or not i was gonna move to chicago yeah and so i was like you know, we kind of mutually agree that it wasn't the best time to be getting into anything, so. Let's see. I remember small, sweet stuff. Like, I remember, like, decorating a high school girlfriend's locker for Valentine's yeah. Day. You you vomit, but, you know, like, girls love that stuff. You yeah. know, like, it's cheesy as hell, but she liked it. I remember my sister coming to school and helping me, like, set stuff up. It was nice. Oh, that's cute. Um, I remember when I was in college, I had, like, a Tinder date with a girl on Valentine's Day, and I think... <laughs> We all hung out, <laughs> like you, me, and her, I think. Oh, my God. I remember that. Oh, my God. That wasn't God. good either. That was you so know, she, awkward. She she got married mere months later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that I went with you on this date. <laughs> I literally went with you to, like, oh, the, did we meet her at the atrium or something? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. We sure did. No. Uh, and then Lily and I, both of our birthdays, 
Valentine's Day and our dating anniversary are all around the same span of time. Mm -hmm. So we always kind of go all out for it all. Uh, our first year, we went to the Melting Pot, which is a romantic, oh yeah, fancy restaurant. And then this year, we were in Disney World for it, which was awesome as well. Nice. But Although I don't I have know. To say my favorite Valentine's days were spent with 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 Y.O.U. Oh yeah, we have had we Stephen and I. I think we've mentioned it. Have spent several Valentine's Day or Pal- Palentine's, Palentine's Day. Day, as we very coolly liked to yeah. put it. Um, <laughs> it got me through some hard times, buddy. Yep. <laughs> so Jeff is asking Slater what she expects out of him for Valentine's Day. And when she responds with like, I want you to do what makes you happy, I feel like he's a little bit let down by that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think he, this is something that's touched on lightly throughout the episode that Slater being down for whatever is what was attractive about her. But now that they're dating and she's down for whatever, it's a little bit boring. Yeah. I don't know. What What do you think? I I think that Jeff still likes that she's so low maintenance. But like it's like he says, kind of touched on later on. Um, I do think that he kind of almost wants her to like demand something of him, you know, because yeah. he does really like her and he's really starting to develop feelings. And even though he's a grown man, he doesn't have a lot of experience in a real relationship. Yeah, but I don't know. I feel like you say that, but they don't know a ton about each other. Yeah. Or at least from what we've seen, you know. That's true. It seems like a very, like, perhaps they like each other, but it seems very base level still at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I feel like Jeff, his interest comes and goes at any moment. I, I could see that, because, I mean, even throughout this episode, he kind of jumps. His attention is not just focused on his girlfriend in this episode. Exactly. Not that I can blame him, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. <laughs> um, so after that, uh, Jeff is walking away from Slater. I imagine she's going to work or set up for the party. Uh, Jeff's checking his voicemail messages. It's very telling that he has a Bluetooth earpiece Yeah. <laughs> connected to his BlackBerry. <laughs> are you sure he's not what, Ryan Seacrest? That's pretty Ryan Seacrest. Yeah, I know. 2010 was a much simpler time. Uh, <laughs> the first message we hear is that where he's been paying tuition with airline miles, which them calling him and leaving this message seems like him trying to do that at least got a certain amount of the way through. You he know got what I mean? a lot further than he should have. Like they went to the point. It should of have been an instant no. But they it. were like, "Hey, we just realized that we've been you've been paying with airline miles. We need a check." Not, "Hey, you tried to," or "Hey, we can't accept this." <laughs> it's like, "Hey, we just realized." <laughs> hey, I just tried to spend those airline miles that you gave us, and uh... <laughs> I think that's pretty funny. And then that goes from that message to the message that puts together the whole a plot of this episode. It's Britta's drunk message which from the very first time i watched the series i've always thought is pretty cringy it's I've, not the best <laughs> you know that gillian jacobs is sober she's like straight edge yeah she's never like drank or smoked or done anything mm-hmm. and she's been in shows like love you know where she plays an addict and i yeah. feel like plays it well but this seems like someone drunk acting that hasn't been drunk that has never drank <laughs> Jeff Winger, I am calling you. <laughs> You're probably <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so, what's up? <laughs> it's like if we tried to be drunk, like when we were kids, you know? Yeah. Like, and basing honestly, it off of what we had seen on TV. M- I'll give MJ that. This, that was very sitcom y, the drunk message. In yes, it way. is. That doesn't happen in real life, I feel like. Maybe no. sometimes when you're. Uh, intoxicated you're more likely to make contact with people but it's rarely this like oh what did i say on the voicemail greeting that i left you know what i mean now in this this leads, i was going to ask you have you are you someone who tends to drunk text or call anybody i guess you kind of answered i'm more of a uh drunk podcast kind of guy <laughs> <laughs> i get drunk and accidentally like oh shit i made a whole podcast about a tv show <laughs> i don't remember that at all i hope i didn't say anything too bad <laughs> no i don't think so Uh, I think I'm more like a, not so much anymore, but I was more like a, it's late and I'm alone text 
mm. kind of guy, and I'm bored or like I ain't, I ain't got nobody hitting me up. I was more of a drunk tweeter. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I see. what about you? Have you been in awkward situations because of things you've said or I'm texted while drunk? I'm definitely a a drunk texter. Yeah, I tend to I <laughs> very late at night when like it's normally when I like come home from like drinking or something like that that's yeah. when i'll i'll get in the field getting off like, the social hey, buzz of being around people and mm-hmm. chilling in your apartment yeah. and i'm like you know what maybe i'll text text this person that i haven't talked to in months yeah. i'm not gonna air my dirty laundry too much even though it seems like more and more often we have no problem doing such on this podcast right uh i definitely now remember a situation where i was intoxicated and hung out with someone this was like as an adult this was a couple years ago hung out with someone Mm -hmm. who i had like cut ties with pretty significantly and then i was like yeah you know what who cares they're gonna take me to taco bell it'll be fine (laughs) and to follow up it it was not fine (laughs) it was not fine oh anyway so So don't uh, drink and drive kids that's the message no don't text and drink i don't care if you drive just (laughs) oh my god and just just treat it like a video game and you'll be fine oh no i'm gonna play some like the more you know music right after that (laughs) we proud we proudly at this show are anti you know racism anti uh homophobia anti-trump but very pro (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Let's move on. <laughs> the views expressed in this podcast do not reflect those of the BBC, NBC, or CDC. Nobody's putting their money into this show. We, d- we can say whatever we want. <laughs> There's nobody that's going to yell at us. <laughs> and now I'm going to talk to you about some quality animated... No, I'm just playing. Just oh, my God. All right. So <laughs> Jeff listens to this message. Uh, it... it, it Britta doesn't really say much to Jeff in this message, nothing really incriminating. Other than that, it's clear that she was thinking about him while she was out drinking. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Do you think it's romantic connotation, like explicitly? No. Do you think it, what's the what's the acronym they're about to say? Do you think it has? DCI? Yeah. Duty call implications? Yeah. I do not. And I think it's because, you know, Britta... Even if she does have some deep down feelings for Jeff, I don't think that call was a feelings for Jeff call. I think that was a I'm drunk and I'm calling my friend. Cause yeah, that call could have easily that voicemail could have just as much been left on Abed's phone, yeah, or on, Shir- or on Shirley's phone, you know. Totally. Yeah, uh, but Jeff has this smirk on his face um, that like he thinks he's got something on Britta. And I think also that, like, he's still got her hook, line, and sinker in mm-hmm. his mind, I think is what's going through his through his, through his his head. Yeah. Uh, Jeff loses some points for me in this episode. A little bit but for me, there too. Are, but there are some things that are the opposite direction, too. It's a weird Jeff episode for me where it's almost split down the middle, stuff he does that I groan at and stuff that he does that I think is charming. Yeah, I think he does a few things this episode that for sure I liked and that mm-hmm. were representative of the Jeff that's had some growth and that cares about his friends. But at the same time, there's some of that sleazeball Jeff that slips out too. Yeah. We cut to the study room. Several of the study members are at the table and the Cupid being arrives to hand out some presents. Uh, Jeff makes a pretty funny comment that'll be repeated by a late Brita later about, oh, he has arrows now. That looks safe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And he brings presents for Shirley from the cook with the beard in the cafeteria, uh, which in the extended version of the episode, she divulged a little bit more about him. Yikes. Uh, <laughs> and he <laughs> gives a rose to um, he gives a rose to Annie from Vaughn. So in the extended version, here she just says, a flower from Vaughn. He's away on a vision quest. Yeah. In the extended version, she goes to read the tag, and it's like, uh, for my flower, to my flower, you're always a flower. <laughs> and, and Annie's like, "Aw, that's sweet. Lead confusing. <laughs> that's a, a very Vaughn silly, message. I love Vaughn, so any little bit of Vaughnism right? that I didn't already know of, I'm happy to get. Uh, Abed gets a big muffin basket that's pretty impressive, but it's just from an actress trying to get into one of his films. <laughs> one of his films for a class on this community college. <laughs> 
Abed is snarky in this opening scene when he, he's like, Yep, Meryl Streep has two Oscars because of her baking. Oh, that's sarcasm, but I forgot to inflect. This sounds way more like sarcasm. Inflection is so interesting. And then the rest of his dialogue in the scene, he's really sarcastic. Yeah, I think it's, it's really like, funny. Inflection is so interesting. <laughs> Pierce and Troy are feeling pretty left out because there wasn't anything for them. I think Jeff would feel that way too, but he keeps mum on the topic. He doesn't say anything. Yeah. Uh, Which nothing... I think, honestly, to your point earlier, might be a sign that he's really not all that really into Slater. I mean, I think he likes her, but if he were really, you know, head over heels, like you said, Jeff would be concerned. Like, well, why didn't Slater send me a Valentine? Or maybe he's just like comfortable enough that you don't expect stuff like that. I was going to say when talking about Valentine's Day earlier, like so far Lily and I have gone out, but I don't think I feel like it's an obligation or like there's something less about our connection if we don't because it's kind of a stupid holiday. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's a good excuse uh, to pretend to be fancy and go yeah, do something it is. together. But yeah, Troy and Pierce are really upset. Uh, Troy tries really hard. He's like, anything there for Troy? Troy Barnes. And Barnes, <laughs> Barnes comma, Troy. Troy. And they all come up blank. The human being is like... <laughs> and then Pierce just waves his arms flailingly like, who cares about the presents? <laughs> and he says it destroys the true meaning of Valentine's Day, which is to celebrate the birth of St. Valentine's, which <laughs> doesn't sound right. I no. think it's because... St. Valentine drove the snakes out of Ireland, right? <laughs> right? Oh. Or is it something about uh, three more days of winter or something? I don't know. I think it's <laughs> something. Uh, didn't they look up and they saw that star, right? And then the Valentine, he had to bring the letter <laughs> to the prince, but all he had was a drum. And then they couldn't stay at the hotel because they were black. That one? Uh, is it? And then Moses know. told the Pharaoh man, let my people go. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> St. Valentine was like, it was like during the Holocaust. You know, St. Valentine like had a list of people that were in concentration camps oh that could work for him, but he was like trying to get them out of the bad situations. I think Spielberg made a movie about it. <laughs> Really, oh, yeah, Valentine's funny. List. Yeah, super funny film. Highly recommended. <laughs> Take uh. a drink of something and speed your way to your nearest video rental store <laughs> and pick up a copy of Valentine's <laughs> List. Isn't the Nero in that picture? I'll play another the more you know. <laughs> All right, moving on from that. <laughs> Um, Brito walks in looking very ill. And again, like a lot of the characters in, or like a lot of the actors in the show so far, I guess Gillian Jacobs was very sick when they filmed this scene. And she literally came in that day. Maybe they all got sick because they were all filming while they were sick. Yeah. And I guess she came in and filmed this scene, which was a convenient one for her to be sick for. Yeah. And then they sent her home for the rest of the day and did other stuff. Well, uh, hey. I guess she was, she like, shivering and, like, over. shaking, and her voice is rough, yeah. Wow. Method acting. So she gets there really late. Uh, the group's leaving, and she makes the same comment to the human being, like, oh, he has arrows now? That sounds safe. Uh, just classic hungover stuff. Mm-hmm. I have never really been hungover like that. Wow. Is that just because it's a thing that's over-exaggerated in film and TV, or are there, like, really, like... They're really debilitating, debilitating hangovers. hangovers. Definitely. I've had like where I, the next day I can feel that I drank last night and I can feel it in my head a little bit, like a slight dizziness maybe, but never have I had like a, like a, I feel truly bad the following morning. The last time I was really hungover, I couldn't get out of bed until like 6 p.m. Jeez. Yeah, it was rough. That doesn't say a lot for you, because I've known you to be a person to get out of bed at like noon or I, one. You know, I wake up pretty early every day. That is not maybe early like eleven. No, I'm up at like eight a.m. every day. Is that true? That's true. Okay, but if I see you tweeting about what anime you're watching at four a.m., and then you'll see me tweeting about what anime I'm watching <laughs> at nine a.m. too. It'll be the same. <laughs> okay, I just don't so sleep. Jeff. 
sits down with Britta while everyone is leaving the study group and says, you know, can I get you something? Water, smelling salts, an alibi for Cobain's suicide. Which that was is a, a funny pretty joke. jagged joke. Yeah. I, when I was a 13-year-old Nirvana fan, I sure did believe that Courtney Love did it. <laughs> uh, who knows? Who knows? Why? Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Statue I mean, of a... I'm sure someone cares. What? <laughs> Um, and Britta comes back with a pretty good remark as out of it she is. And she's like, no, but you could help yourself to a shorter forehead. <laughs> a non-Keebler nose and shutting up. Joel McHale does have a large forehead, and they like to point it out whenever they get a chance. They really do. And that's, you know, good for him being a good sport. Is it that he has a large forehead, or is it that his hairline's been receding since 2002? I think it's the hairline. It, he looks great. His hairline looks good. It looks a lot healthier, but I think that's why the forehead appears to be so large. Yeah, there's a lot more exposed space there. Yeah, next time you go for those plugs, Joel, <laughs> yeah. just Look at bring Steve him in Carell. a little lower. Bring him in a, yeah, Steve Carell's like hot now. Yeah. That's weird. It's crazy. I don't get it how it happened, but it did. I also feel like Steve Carell's not a good actor anymore. <laughs> um, Who knows? Maybe he was he just... in this movie called... Welcome to Marwin. I heard that was so bad. It was one of the worst. I think it was the Isn't year that I saw, book? like, yeah. It's based on a true story. That's, like, a really heartwarming true story, but the film was terrible. And mm-hmm. it was the film that, using stuff like Movie Pass and AMC A-List, I saw, like, 60, 70 movies in the theater yeah. in one year. And I made a list of, like, the best and worst. And I think Welcome to Marwin was like second worst only to the happy time murders wow wow and steve carell was dreadful in it and i've seen him in some other stuff lately that's good but not him that makes like, me real like sad. the morning show on apple tv plus yeah he's not good in that he's not awful but he's not the high point of the show at all Dang. jennifer aniston however is really good in it i love jennifer aniston it's a surprisingly decent show. Hmm. Maybe I'll check it so, out. So Britta is super hungover because she was with an anarchist girlfriend from her past life, and they got super drunk. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whenever they bring up that side of Britta, I'm like, okay, whatever. I'm like, all right. Uh, and Jeff reveals, you called me last night or like slyly because Britta's like yeah because the first time the first thing I do when I'm drinking is think of and then Jeff plays the incriminating message Jeff for her. Winger. I am calling you. You're probably <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and Britta's just dumbfounded. I get that they have the type of relationship where Jeff would have to rib on Britta for this a little bit, but it's a little mean-spirited. Uh, I don't like the booty call, uh, what is it, implication? Yeah, I think that's pretty stupid. It's very juvenile of Jeff. Mm -hmm. And then when Britta gets, like, offended and leaves the room, Jeff literally laughs her out of the room. Yeah, that's pretty douchey. Because, like, she clearly was actually upset about it and embarrassed. Yeah. And that's what makes it shitty. Yeah, super shitty. Uh, But that does, I guess, set up that now Jeff feels bad and has to uh, has to make up this to her somehow, mm-hmm. but it's not it's not a good color on him. No, I do have a question about this little next part though. Okay, why does Abed come back in the room? I thought everybody left to go somewhere. Because I think he probably like is like something's happening. Yeah, that's. True. I don't know. That's a good question. It's a TV show, Steve, and I didn't write it. Why don't you ask Chris McKenna? <laughs> oh, I have. <laughs> If we ever have him in the show, Stephen will be like, um, in season one, episode 16, why does Abed hang out behind? And be like, I, don't I thought they know. were I like for class. I wrote the show 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> why don't they ever actually study Spanish? <laughs> um, How many credits do they need to graduate Greendale? Because if they've passed this many classes, I can assume they're doing this many hours a week. Abed came back because he saw Britta leave upset, and he says, what happened to Britta? To which Jeff says, justice. Yeah, and asshole. has this really douchey line about how this drunk call confirms that Britta's really been attracted to Jeff this whole time. Not a good color on Jeff. I don't like it. Mm-hmm. I don't like it. But I do like how Abed immediately is like a drunk dial. Was it BCI? <laughs> As if that's a thing that just everybody knows. Right? Like, you know that he's like, oh, that must be the lingo because Jeff says it. 
booty with a capital B, Jeff says. I hate that he says booty call with a capital B, especially when C is one of the letters. So technically C would have to be capital too. In the the extended version, Jeff goes on to say something like, capital B flipped on its side so it looks like a booty. Yikes. I'm really glad that wasn't in the... (laughs) (laughs) Me too. Oh no. There were quite a few of the extended episode lines. I was like, oh shit. Yeah, I got oh, reason, no. dude. That's pretty cringy. There are a couple of those. <laughs> uh, Jeff's like, oh, this can't be that bad. You know, me and Britta give each other crap all the time. And uh, Abed points out pretty astutely, well, like, this is a bad thing for Britta. Because, like, how can she dish out crap on Jeff now that she's, like, embarrassed of something that involves her and Jeff? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, how can she rag on Jeff when Jeff, like, has something real to, like, hold over her? It's true. It's like in, in, you know, like in our relationship, if either of us, you know, had not a balance of power, it'd, it'd be Where are you going with this? dangerous, you know? <laughs> and what is the balance of power right there? Zach, we you're both we know... we have equal power? No. Obviously. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, yeah, obviously. We're both on the same page. It's very clear where the, the larger amount of power lies. Yeah, it is like so obviously. hardcore 70-30 that it's like... Yeah. yeah, I'm so glad we're on the same page and yeah. that you don't feel upset about it. Yeah, That's I'm really glad that nice. you don't feel upset about it either. You know, we just take things in stride. Yeah. We've really grown as yeah. people. But it's nice to know that we both know that there's a large distance between the amount of power that we both have. Yeah, very big gap. Like, very noticeably. Yeah, everyone who listens Without knows. question. We should do a Twitter poll that's we like, should. who is more powerful? <laughs> <laughs> I have not yet begun to peak. I, oh, when I, I peak, you'll know. My power. You'll feel it. Unlimited power. <laughs> have you ever been in a storm? <laughs> I hate sand. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jeff is like, Abed, is that really real? Do I really have to worry about this? And Abed goes back into that like really weird, like s- sarcastic gaze. Like, no, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I never watch TV. <laughs> Uh, and then we cut to the I theme song. TV. That was good. A pretty long opening blurb. That's like the first four minutes of the episode, and it literally just set up all the plots. It wasn't like a like stinger of a joke to start off the episode. It was I, like the first portion of the episode. I was a pretty big fan of the pace of this episode. Each time I mm-hmm. watched it, I feel like there was no dragging part. Sometimes in some episodes of the show, I feel like when they need to break up the a plot sometimes they have unnecessary b plot scenes like we've talked about like uh Mm. with some of the like britta shirley stuff in the past i know it was one episode that we said that there's like three scenes of them sitting outside on the bench like talking about the same thing exactly and i don't feel that at all good at it and i think a lot of it's that they get to know the characters better Mm -hmm. you know that you can put just about any pairing of character and actor and it it worked pretty well at this point and they trust us to fill in the blanks yeah they shouldn't trust you anything with your power level but <laughs> it's over nine thousand, zach after the theme song we cut to chang's class this is when chang gives his killer uh, uh uh impressions of animals there's a weird moment where like jeff and britta make eye contact and jeff's kind of got like a dopey like laugh at the situation face and britta's clearly still embarrassed she hides herself from him Poor, Poor Britta. She didn't do anything. She, and the message wasn't yeah. even that incriminating. It wasn't bad at all. It's not like she was like, oh, Jeff. Something, something. No, she was like, what's up? If someone was like, I've got some dirt on you, and then that's what they played, I'd be like, oh, thank God. Right? <laughs> that could have been so worse. I feel like sober Britta is likely to call somebody and go, what's up? So I, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Turn it into a snake. <laughs> <laughs> if she does that when sober, yeah. Yeah. Kiki Ricky. <laughs> there was a pretty funny uh, cut in the extended version where when Chang's doing his impression, he's like standing on top of someone's desk. <laughs> and then the human being, the Cupid being, walks in to disperse presence. And Chang's like, can't you see I'm teaching? You're interrupting. <laughs> that part was kind of funny. That's nice. But the the human being, oh, in, I guess he kind of does he's, that in yeah. here too. But in, in the extended one, he's like jumping up and down on top of Annie's desk. <laughs> looking real ridiculous 
Always the Annie's human, desk. The human being comes in with more presence, and immediately Troy is like, oh, wonder what this could be, like shrugging, like, mm, probably not for me again. <laughs> but no, it's it's a big old present for both Pierce and Troy. Uh, what do you think about this Pierce and Troy plot line? Um, I think that the payoff is really, really funny. Mm. Um, it could have gone the other way. It could have fizzled out. It could have. And and thankfully, it, it like led to a really good payoff. Yeah, like I think, that, and we'll get to it. But one of my like, I think funniest visuals that Community has created for me so far is in this episode, and it's because Troy of the dancing. Spotlight. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we'll get to it. <laughs> I like the joke here, and I love the stuffed human being with a heart that Troy gets for himself. <laughs> it's so <clears throat> scary. <laughs> I would love to have that. I wonder if that's some real... St- I bet I you could find that on like, Etsy or something. I'm kind of going through a little bit of a phase where I feel like I need to up my like community memorabilia game. Oh, yeah. You know? Listen, We're going to be doing got... this show for a long time. Yeah. Um, you've got, not community related, but you've got like your pop culture Hey, corner. I have a Troy. I'm not saying pop. you don't have stuff. But yeah, I'm just saying, like, anime. I think, especially if we want to transition the show to video at some point, I need to get some stuff. Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. And if any fan, uh, you know, wants to be the best fan ever, you know, $2,000 will buy you Britta's pork chop costume from the season four Halloween episode on eBay. I just want to say the fact that your girlfriend is not willing to, uh, you know, blood, sweat, tears, break her back to get that for you says a lot. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty shitty. Mm-hmm. The The reason that I looked up community props, and this is a total diver... So one of the people that's on Big Brother this year, All Stars, that got evicted early is like... Her name's Janelle. She's like a big Big Brother icon. Mm-hmm. And after she got off for a charity, she auctioned off on eBay this necklace that she wore throughout a couple episodes that says Janelle on it. Uh huh. That's like her own necklace. And she auctioned it off for charity. And I've been like looking up the amount of money people are bidding on it is insane wow i was like oh i wonder how much that's gonna be and it was like oh five thousand dollars are you serious and i clicked on it and it was like oh shit seven thousand dollars wow and i clicked on it yesterday seventeen thousand dollars that's crazy and that was yesterday was still like six days left of the auction <laughs> that's crazy. so that made me think like i wonder I, it got me looking like i wonder if there, i could yeah. get i remember when community ended a lot of times when shows end they'll have auctions of props mm-hmm because they're getting rid of it. And I remember they were auctioning off, like, the study table. Oh, that's cool. Adult Zach would definitely spend a couple thousand dollars on the community study table. Yeah. Like, without question. But and I can't blame I you, because there's a few n- things not like able that to that, that I would time. absolutely drop an exorbitant amount of money on. Like, yeah, if I had the community study table just sitting in my house, if we could, like, eat dinner around it, or just I'd be like, don't touch it! <laughs> You would have so many layers of plastic wrapped around it. Yeah, I just looked it up. That Janelle necklace is now at eighteen thousand three hundred dollars. Wow! With five days, two hours left. Guys, right into the show. How much would you pay for a necklace worn by Zach, myself, or both? We'll take special requests. <laughs> I like Troy's line when he's getting the present that he made up a backstory on how he met this girl <laughs> that she was looking for geology class and misread the sign. <laughs> It's a really She's cute. pretty stupid. <laughs> I said, we do not study countries in here. She's oh. dumb, but sweet, much like Troy Barnes himself. Well, yeah, because I love that Troy thinks that geology and geography are the same thing. Yeah, and we've discussed Pierce's date quite a bit. They're sleeping together. What's her name? <laughs> Danielle. Dan- they met in marketing class, and oh. they sound like very lucky ladies, yeah. Annie says, which <laughs> nobody's even... You know, everybody's probably thinking that they made this up. Nobody's questioning it, yeah, questioning it right away. Thing. And Choi is immediately like, yeah, they're not made up. <laughs> <laughs> then we get a pretty funny Chang just beep, beep, beep. Oh, my God, what's going on? Beep, beep, beep. My bullcrap meter's going crazy. And he's calling them out for for uh, for clearly being full of shit. Yeah. I think Chang goes a little too far in this episode, even for Chang. Yeah, he's he definitely pretty mean. does some stuff a teacher shouldn't do. But I love the joke that we get later because of his like uh, crap meter. Yeah, you know what I'm talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. I think that's a nice payoff. Mm-hmm. A little bit later, his bullcrap meter goes berserk, and he just 
calls out in front of everyone that Troy and Pierce obviously made up these women. Uh, they sent these presents to themselves. Uh, Pierce's trimmer handwriting is very clearly his own. <laughs> Troy. <laughs> A funny line that was in the extended version, here Chang says, like, this is the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen. And in the extended version, he's like, this is the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen. And I one time showed up to class without wearing pants or underwear. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> Shirley and Annie feel bad about how mean Chang is to the dudes. Mm-hmm. They're just trying to, I don't know, they, they're being a little pathetic, but I don't know. It's a little wholesome. They're not doing anything wrong. Yeah. So now we cut to the cafeteria, and Shirley and Annie are watching and discussing Chang while he cuts up a steak. Are they serving steak like Maybe that at the Greendale Chang. cafeteria? Chang probably has. Did he bring in. it himself? I could also see him bringing it himself and putting it on his plate. He truly just eats it like an animal. Yeah. Like so truly, he he like saws off all the gristle with a plastic knife <laughs> to then eat just the gristle. I relate. I like it. Are you a steak man? Oh yeah, I I am an everything food man. How do you eat your steak? What what's what's your ideal steak? I like medium, cooked medium, and that's just because I you know, no matter where you go, they can cook a medium steak. Now if I'm going somewhere really fancy, I'll get medium rare, but you know, medium steak, season it up good. Now I like to grill my own, but yeah, I like steak. Do you like steak? I like my steak. I love steak. I like my steak medium rare, but I do agree that most times I get it how I want it, but sometimes it'll be overcooked, which is no problem. Mm-hmm. But every now and then it'll be undercooked, which is never fun. Yeah. Um, what about like, so you season up your steak. Do you put steak sauce on your steak? Do you eat it plain? Um, It depends. If I it's, like A1 steak sauce on my steak. I even really if it's like a great A1 steak. steak. And I'll sauce. eat some of it without sauce to appreciate it. Yeah, I really same like here. A1. I was raised and only to A1. always take a I don't bite. like... I don't like no house steak sauces. Those like sweet steak sauces that oh, they have no. at steak houses. They don't have a one of me. A one. Now I want a steak, dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about like fat and gristle? Do you eat? Yes. Everything presented to you on the plate. Yeah. I do too. Sometimes it's a little too tough, and there will be little pieces I don't eat. But typically, I'm gonna eat it all. Yeah, I'm also that guy though. That I mean, we've been to Buffalo Wild Wings together. I I eat chicken wings down until there's nothing left but the bone. And Chang does too. I love how he's chewing on his gristle on his fork and he's just like looking both ways. <laughs> like he's like a like a like a stray cat yeah. eating food that he's found ready to run away at first glimpse. Uh Shirley and Annie decide that Chang needs to be humiliated publicly because uh he humiliated Pierce and Troy. I think it's sweet. Um this is a nice little C plot. Yeah. Like attached to the B plot. And we get, for the first time, Shirley and Annie do a pinky, um, like, yeah, they connect pinkies and fist bump. It's like a thing that they do throughout the series. Yeah, this their, their whole plot line feels very, like, not quite, uh, I want to say Babysitter's Club, that's not what I mean. I mean, I guess kind of, but it's very much like, okay, team, let's do this. Secret plan, Nancy Drew type thing. Chang here says juice box. So it was him that said juice box, not the kid Chang later on. Ah. He demands from one of the cafeteria workers a juice box. He's got a soda. Yep. He doesn't need a juice box. Nope. Also, he's a Spanish professor. How how does he have such pull over all these students? I think people just know that he's nuts. And if he says for you to do something and you can do it, you might as well just do it. Yeah. Jeff comes up to Britta in the cafeteria line and kind of makes a comment at her. Another classic community, one of the characters cutting the lunch line without any disdain. And Britta just puts him off. You know, she's still embarrassed. And uh, Jeff tells the story about getting drunk at Disney World, trying to make her feel better, but it doesn't really work. Yeah, here I felt really bad for Britta because, like, he comes up and makes a joke about her, you know, getting sick and her throwing up. And, like, she doesn't even, you know, come back with anything, which is very unlike Britta. Yeah, and then when he says the Disney World story, she's like, why are you doing this? And then she's like, don't pity me. I don't know. It, it's sad. Yeah, I felt bad for her. I feel bad for Britta as well. And Britta asks Jeff to uh, leave her alone, which is fair. And it, it hits Jeff the right way. He sees that 
uh, as usual, way too late, he sees what he's done. Yeah, and it was, and I, and it, and I think it especially hit because it wasn't like a "I'm mad at you, don't talk to me." It was like a, "I'll talk to you later." I just like right now, still, still. Which going sometimes is it. worse. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Sometimes is worse because the real friends will come back. Yeah. But then when you know that you've made them really upset, it's like, oh my god. Yeah, you feel extra bad. Now we cut back to the Spanish classroom, and it's a child impersonating Chang, <laughs> the child from Tropic Thunder. Uh, it's another one of Abed's Community College Chronicles. Um, I love he, the kids. Beep, 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 beep. My duty meter is going <laughs> off the radar to fake Troy, Pierce, and Shirley. Uh, and Abed cuts it. He's not feeling it. Uh, you know, Leo just isn't holding the imaginary duty meter in a believable way. What is going on here? Beep, 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 My duty meter's going crazy. <laughs> Sad. Uh, and yeah, the the question earlier, the problem is not me, it's you and your stupid script. And he kicks the trash can and leaves. Abed says, use that anger. Jeff's here to ask Abed for advice on the British situation since Abed kind of poked his nose into it earlier. Uh, Abed makes a comment to Joel about how the kid playing Chang did one commercial and now he thinks he's Christian Bale. <laughs> have, you, funny. have you heard that Christian Bale tape? Do you know uh, the one they're referencing? Which you one? The one right? where he freaks out Cussed and hits somebody a with a phone? <laughs> or... No, no, no. It was He was on the set of Terminator. <laughs> and then it was when he was filming The Fighter, I think, that his sister or mom or somebody called the cops on him because he hit him with a phone and yelled Jesus. at them in like a hotel room. And that was a tape, too, that was pretty bad. Well, I think common knowledge has come to kind of defend him for the lighting guy one because the lighting guy really was f***ing up and being unprofessional. Yeah. And when you're an actor in this film where you're really trying to be in deep in character, I don't know. Well, especially with Christian Bale, who, like, so physically has altered himself Commits. for films. Yeah. And should we be surprised that that affects his mental state? No. I think he's a great actor. I mean, he's, uh, you know, very One of the emotional. best of our generation, for sure. Yeah. Top notch. He's in one of my favorite movies of all time, The Fighter. I've never seen The Fighter. I like it a that, lot. Is that the one that he lost a shit ton of weight for? Yep. Um... Mark Mark Wahlberg plays his brother. It's it's actually based on a true story, but he plays like his older brother who was like a professional boxer, but now is like a druggie in and out of jail. I've heard it's really good. I just haven't gotten to it yet. I think I own it. I should. Uh, so Jeff mentions to Abed that you know he was right, and there is something weird between him and Britta now because of what he called her out on. And they mentioned that it feels a lot like the sitcom trope of one character seeing another character naked. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like they did that, they mentioned that it happened on the opening credits of Who's the Boss. Uh, Jeff asks a question about Who's the Boss, and Abed says that he can never get past the opening credits of Who's the Boss, which is a contradiction because in a future season, he takes a Who's the Boss class and knows a lot about the show. That's what I thought is that he yeah. was more knowledgeable than, knowledgeable than that. And I know you're a Friends fan, so I'm sure the reference to the episode where Rachel sees Chandler naked or vice versa, uh, like, stood out to you. Yeah, it was really funny. It's actually I a very funny episode of the show. You say that, but I feel like that's an example of why that show ages poorly. A storyline about a man walking in and seeing a woman naked and then, like, retribution of seeing the dude's dick is just lazy and... I don't know. It's funny because of the people. It's not funny because of the situation. I I think... <sighs> we should do a Friends podcast, and you'll be pro and I'll be anti. We will argue every episode. <laughs> that could be fun. Uh, so, yeah, they're talking about that, and uh, it gets them to the realization that, figuratively, since Jeff has seen Britta naked, like the, like the sitcom... Mm -hmm. uh, this is stuff like the sitcom gods declare so Britta must see Jeff naked to make it even Jeff must do something embarrassing that makes things work with him and Britta yeah I uh what do you do you think that this is a fair comparison do you think that like now I don't think that Britta embarrassed herself to the point that she feels like she has you know but do you think that like the kind of an eye for an eye thing is is the right right course of action for Jeff here not really. That's very sitcom y yeah. to go off of what MJ says. It makes for a funny episode. Mm -hmm. I like the the Jeff Abed stuff that's about to come out of it. 
but no, not really. Yeah, I think real life, it's not not the move. I really like in this episode how much we see of Abed in director mode. Yeah. And how Abed's kind of even in director mode with him trying to fix Jeff's issue, I like quite a bit. Yeah, I like the, you know, and how committed Abed is to, like, you know, making sure that everything goes right. And which right. he goes on to say in a little bit. I mean, that this is really important to him. Right. They decide that Jeff needs to drunk dial Britta to, uh, you know, eye for an eye to make it work. And Jeff tries to prove that he can just act drunk and makes it clear that he can't. <laughs> I think he still does a better job of Britta's <laughs> supposed really real drunk call. But I get why Abed would be the type of director that's going to be like, if you're going to do this, you should do it. Mm-hmm. I've noticed in the background of this scene, Pavel is there, the the student who lives close to Abed's yeah. dorm. Uh, I don't know why he's not involved. I, maybe he's a film student. I don't know. Yeah, I wasn't totally he's sure he was there. there. I thought maybe he was like helping out. but Jeff tries again to pretend to be drunk and fails badly enough that Abed's like, okay, I need to give this my full attention. He calls off his film crew and he agrees to have Jeff come to his place so they can work on this and do it methodly. Um, That's about all that's going on right here. Jeff thinks the idea is a little bit dumb. I don't know. Not a lot to say here. Yeah. What do you, what do you think? Um, like you said, I think it, it makes for a funny episode and I like the, the like them together because I love Jeff and Abed's friendship. But, yeah, you know, it's not... Even so, with this being a Jeff Abed episode, there's not a ton of the sweetness that we've gotten out of their friendship so far and that we will get in the future. It's more than just broing. Yeah, which is also fun to see. Mm-hmm. This scene ends with the funny line of the young actor playing Chang coming up and being like, hey, sorry, I just blown up. I just quit smoking. <laughs> I was like, kid's going to be a star. A star. Have you watched Lost? Have- I have seen the first, like, season and a half of Lost. And while I watched the first season, I loved it. And I don't know why I fell out of it, but it's still on the bookshelf, and I'll take it off sometime. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard it's good. I'll, I'm sure I might watch it at some point. The first season was really compelling, and then the second season gets a lot deeper into the mythology of mm-hmm. what's going on, which I found interesting, but was like, okay, if I'm going to dive into this, I need to really dive into it. Yeah. I just never really did. But the first season was a great like survival story. I remember when it aired, like, watching the first episode because there was so much hype around it. Like, I think my mom and I watched it when I was a kid, you know, but I don't – we definitely didn't watch the show regularly. Yeah. On top of that, almost more so than Lost, with as much as I like Big Brother, I've never watched Survivor, and I kind of want to get into Survivor. I have a lot of friends that really, really like it. I never got super into it, but I've seen it before. It's it's an interesting concept. It is – it's kind of like Big Brother to a degree – you know, in terms of the game. Some things are more intense about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, now we cut to uh, Abed's dorm room. And Jeff is taking shots uh, while Abed coaches him. It feels really awkward. It feels like uh, Abed's just staring at him while he's drinking. And after every shot, he makes Jeff pretend to call Britta. I like when Jeff uses his hand as a phone. And he's like, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> I don't know. The way he dials the yeah, phone, that I funny. thought was silly. And this is when we get that cringy, you got me thinking, and thinking, got me drinking. <laughs> yeah, hey, Abed hit him with the go ahead and log out for me on that one because that, that was that was not awful. Great. <laughs> Remove yourself. Yeah. Uh, Abed joins him and says, even though he doesn't drink, that if he's gonna help Jeff, he should probably be in the same. Uh, boat as Jeff. I like how I don't know getting drunk really wrecks Abed in this episode, but it doesn't change him very much at <laughs> yeah. all. Like as far as his impairment that you can see. <laughs> I like how like almost mechanically he picks up the bottle and starts drinking it because it's like okay, grab it, get it done as fast as possible. <laughs> very funny. Jeff keeps drinking and Abed shows like a headshot of Britta. Uh, to try to get her, try to get Jeff's thoughts going. Jeff says, "Oh, I like Britta immediately uh, after seeing the photo." And Abed's like, "Well, over half of people that meet her don't. They can be put off by her vacuous mannequin face." <laughs> rude. Yeah, very rude. Not true. No, she's beautiful. I don't know. In this scene, they just discuss Britta and why Jeff likes her. I don't know if this is just supposed to be a scene of like. 
establishing that Jeff isn't drunk enough to make that phone call, but he's becoming tipsy to have conversations like this. I also totally didn't get what level they were trying to represent him being at. Because, like mm-hmm. you said, it's kind of that in between. It's like, well, he's clearly, you know, drunk, but Abed still says, no, hold off on the call. And yeah, Jeff talks about how it was only attraction to Britta that he was interested in at first and that he's happy with Slater. I don't know. It's like Abed starts kind of therapizing him to get, like, a performance out of him. Mm-hmm. Um, they discuss, you know, Slater being low maintenance and how he really likes that and that Britta can be irritating and and she didn't like Jeff, so it's like the total opposite. But because Slater is so low profile, uh, he's, Jeff is safe from change and passion. Yeah. Which the, I, Abed is always just completely reads the situation when nobody else has. Uh, Jeff gets a little defensive about it. Abed says, you know what, do you want to, you know, leave Britta a drunk message that means nothing and won't fix anything? Or do you want to tap into your emotions and do something real? Mm-hmm. I don't know. A little silly. <laughs> but I like seeing director Abed. Yeah. That's, I, it's well done even if it's sitcom <laughs> A pretty sitcom line that puts things astutely is when Jeff says, You know, I am sure you're a good director, but you are a horrible drinking buddy. And Abed totally makes, like, the, the praying mantis arms <laughs> before Jeff refers to him as a praying mantis, like, leering over him, which is pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, Danny Pudi can totally do this, like, bug face. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, it's very funny. Abed just starts chugging from the bottle because Scorsese drank with De Niro. He <laughs> takes it like a champ. Yeah, he does. He takes a huge swig of, of, of what looks like vodka yeah. and then pours them both another shot. Oof. And this starts the the montage from the episode that is, you know, one of the more memorable moments of the episode. Yeah, I, I thought it's, the montage was great. I feel like this episode has some shades of some previous episodes, but does them better. Mm-hmm. It has shades of, oh, the episode when Jeff was living in his car. Yeah. And had to live in Abed's dorm. Uh, so it does like the dorm room shenanigans with Jeff and Abed again, but I think it does it a little bit better. And likewise with the school dance stuff, I think it kind of has shades of the STD dance oh episode. totally and i think this does that better too mm-hmm. in this montage we see them you know we mentioned playing beer pong with out of a punch bowl that i imagine was full at one point and they just take long drags out of it <laughs> uh they're like dancing like an egyptian on the table they're mimicking the breakfast club jeff holds abed upside down while he drinks <laughs> They're just going wild. I like the shots of them dancing that, like, it cuts between Jeff and Abed, like, back and forth. Yeah. And, like, in each shot, they get a little bit closer to the ground. (laughs) And then it cuts to the other person, like, at the same level, like, getting a little bit closer to the ground. Yeah, that's cool. I think it's pretty funny. Uh, They pour vodka over a hot dog and then, like, uh, heat it up with a candle lighter while looking at a a picture of Britta. (laughs) I don't think so. I was, uh, I was like, does that make it cook faster? Or? Jeff drinks alcohol through like a like a beer bong that's poked through Britta's mouth on a photo, which is pretty weird to see from a man well, who just uh, was talking about how into Michelle Slater he is. Yeah, he also kind of like, like caresses stroking the her face. face. Yeah, yeah, weird. Uh, they sword fight Jeff and Abed with, with drinks in hand. They shotgun a beer together. It, it, there are some shades of a little bit of what it was like when we hung out our <laughs> college year. Uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I feel like we shotgunned a beer. Did we shotgun a beer? Yeah, to, uh, to various levels of success. I remember totally doing the cliche thing of walking around with a, a six-pack of beer and then throwing the bottles yep. and smashing them. Oh, absolutely, because there was that like little lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, wow. Fun it time. was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Accurate sure. statement. Uh, the pizza guy knocks on on Abed's door, and when they answer, Jeff's doing shirtless push-ups in the background <laughs> on the table and just looks and smiles at the at the at the pizza guy while Abed's like in full like Deadpool get up. He's got a sword <laughs> strapped to his back and a luchador mask on. Pretty funny visual. And then the next cut, it, it doesn't explain any of that at all. Now all three of them, including the pizza guy, are dancing like the breakfast club on Abed's table. I like to think that the pizza guy saw what was going on and was like, I'm joining this party. Yeah, no tip needed. 
I love the shots of them dancing. It makes me want to watch The Breakfast Club again, which I haven't done in a while. Oh, such a good one. We get a shot. It looks like Jeff's about to dial Britta, and Abed's like, nope, one more beer. <laughs> and then we cut to them passed out on the ground, Jeff cracking up laughing, and then we cut. We're done with that night. We don't exactly know if Jeff ever made the call or not. Mm-hmm. Now we're back to class. Uh, Chang notices that Seacrest and Slumdog, which Oof. I don't know. Have taken the day off the law firm of Seacrest and Slumdog. Uh, Funny joke, and... not necessarily the best nickname. No, not the best. There's another special delivery from the Cupid being. Uh, this is appearingly, uh, you know, Troy and Pierce have done another fake gift, but I think their pride is too wounded to do something like that again. Uh, it's it's this note that Chang is getting. It's it's Shirley and Annie's C plot plan to embarrass him mm-hmm. coming to a coming to a head. It's a letter from Princeton that's asking Chang to be what the associate Spanish department professor or something. Yeah, I like that they didn't do anything more with this. I'm glad that he instantly knew that it was fake. Yeah, I am too, because that would have been too much. Too sitcom If he had been like, oh my god, and like started packing his bags or it's something. It's like, you know, they, they do this joke a few times on The Office where they, you know, trick Dwight into thinking that the FBI is like, or the CIA, like, is trying to hire him or something like that. And he's like, okay, I'm and ready to go. And scenes are funny, but, you know, it's like, fool me once, shame on me, but like, fool me nine seasons. Yeah. <laughs> And it makes total sense that not only would Chang know that this was fake right away, but that he would blame it on Pierce and Troy, the people who he just gave a bunch of shit to. Yeah. And they didn't do it. And they're honestly saying that they didn't, but Chang doesn't care. And this is when he totally breaks any type of teacher code that he was still upholding. Uh, And he makes them as a punishment because they obviously don't have girlfriends to escort him to the dance wearing pantsuits like elegant ladies pantsuits yeah very much violating some clear teacher codes but it's fine yeah not only that he says if they don't do it he'll fail their class when pierce is like you can't do that chang gets it in his face and points at his crazy brain and goes do you even know me <laughs> tonight you are my bitches he says to his students <laughs> you ever have a teacher say anything like that you ever have like a teacher really cross the line Not with me, necessarily. Now, I was in a classroom where a teacher definitely crossed the line a little bit when it came to getting physical with a student, but... Oh, no. Yeah. Are you talking about a certain substitute teacher? No, I'm talking about a certain computer teacher. When did you start... I don't know about this at all. What grade did you start going to public school? I was at Highland my freshman year. That was my first year. And then sophomore on at Anderson. Do you remember the computer teacher that stopped teaching computers and went to history no i don't think i ever had this teacher Uh, if you want to say his name i'll bleep it out okay well mr was a computer that name sounds really familiar but i never he's been teaching there forever but in my computer class he threw a chair at a kid oh shit i thought when you said getting physical well no he no not sexually he like and then like he and uh (laughs) got in a whole fight like like he like pushed the kid up against the wall and the kid like fought him oh my god yeah so then he switched from i wish i had computers his class. to history oh he was crazy he kicked me out in the very last day it was crazy it was like we were sitting there and i was typing probably playing a game or something and he was like steven and i was like yeah and he's like get out of here and i was like what And he's like i'm tired of you disrespecting me in my classroom i said what did i do he said i'm tired of your disruptions get out of here so i walked down to the dean's office and i was like he like sent me out and they're like what'd you do and i was like i really don't know and they're like well you can just wait here till the end of the day because it was my last period class so i I looked out there that makes me think of a couple of a couple of situations i remember the substitute teacher i thought you were talking about was always a little too kind to the attractive young women are you talking about the one who is dead now whose wife was involved with the show choir (laughs) mr oh shit and this is a story i don't know if any of this is ever is gonna make the podcast yeah this is a story that he i remember being in a class with him and he was like joking around or something and he would always like make jokes that were like uh you probably shouldn't say that man and yeah. he went around like high fiving people, and he said something that was like explicitly that he won't high five black people. What the fuck? He said I'll fist bump. He said like it's all com- it's coming back to me. He was like I'll fist bump. A- He's like I'll fist bump a brother, oh, but I won't no. high five him. 
because I know where they've been. Oh, my God. And then he looked around at everyone like, am I right? Am I right? And everyone in our, you know, predominantly racist Indiana yeah. high school, everyone in the classroom was like, what the f***? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. But absolutely yeah. believable. Yeah. Moving on. Um, <laughs> now we cut back to the next day. Uh, Jeff rolls over in Abed's dorm bed with a squirt gun in hand and the luchador mask on, which he takes off to reveal the Phantom of the Opera mask. Are you a Phantom fan? I am a Phantom fan. I'm a theater boy, and I've never seen the Phantom of the Opera, the film or the play. You're kidding. I'm truly not kidding. I'm shocked. Weren't you in that, like, study period that was supposed to be music history, but it was in the choir room and we just watched musicals? Um, I don't think I was in it with you, no. Oh. I think I was in the choir room a lot, though. Because I know that I I've had never that seen with the Chelsea, and I thought that Bryce was in there. Okay, too. well, if if I did have it, and all of those people were in it, we probably didn't watch the movie. That's fair. So Jeff rolls out of bed. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. Abed's literally asleep in a drawer, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, uh, last night it was like we were." Abed's brain is broken now. He can't get any of his pop culture references out. He's like. Uh, uh, you were dancing like that girl in that movie. Kids in Detention is what the movie title was. Mm, okay. He calls it Kids in Detention Breakfast Club. Breakfast then Club. Then Abed goes, dear God, so what you have you done to me? I did say that. But I thought mm-hmm. he was saying it more as like I describing did it as rather describer. than titling it. And Jeff doesn't remember if he called Britta. And Abed can confirm that he made two outgoing calls, one to Britta and one to Slater. But neither of them remember it. Do you think well, and this I is was a little surprised. bit of a stretch? Um, no, I do not. <laughs> You're surprised what? I'm surprised that he wasn't more concerned about his phone call to Slater. Yeah, they don't even mention it. Because he was worried about his call to Britta. Yeah, which kind of shows Slater you where Jeff's head is, like who he's more worried about in general. Yeah. He this whole episode, he's focused on Britta, even though, you know, his girlfriend is putting together this dance that he wa- that she wants Jeff to be involved with and wants him to come, and he's worrying about this Britta thing. Mm-hmm. The episode smartly doesn't make the whole thing about that. We're already like two thirds through the episode, and there hasn't been any like Slater jealousy. And they no. do touch on it, and it feels justified. Yeah, because... and it feels like an appropriate amount for somebody who is as invested as Slater is. Yeah, right? absolutely. You know? We'll get to that in a second. Uh, Ovid has that funny line where he's trying to remember Molly Ringwald's name that <laughs> I thought was pretty funny. Yeah. I don't remember the name of the girl in the Breakfast Club. Mary. Margaret. Molly Ringworm. I also like that Abed has one nerf dart on his forehead. Yeah. That has seemingly been there all night. <laughs> but Abed's broken. The alcohol broke him. Hung over Abed. Can't even function. It's funny to see. <laughs> yeah, I think Danny Pudi really does a great job this whole episode of being very Abed, even when he's, you know, being a broken Abed. Right. After that, we get, we're back in the study room. Uh, Troy and Pierce are walking in with bags with their outfits that they're going to have to wear to the Valentine's dance. Pierce is talking here about how he can't believe he's a size 14 and the size 12 is a little tight, but he could have pulled it off. (laughs) Uh, Britta is really surprised that they're going through with it. Um, And they, they, you know, Troy and Pierce... They're like, we have no choice. They're going to fail us if we don't do it. Chang's crazy. We got to just get this over with. And they're trying to find who did this prank, the Princeton letterhead prank, uh, and get revenge for it. They don't know that it was their friends trying to do something nice for them. Mm -hmm. Annie starts to tell them the truth, but Shirley, like, shuts it down as quick as possible. Shirley nixed it real quick. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. Uh, and, and Annie covers fine when she's like, oh, well, women's sizes run slimmer. I'm sure you're a 12 everywhere that it counts. Which <laughs> I'll get a sweet so. Pierce line there. She's <laughs> like, I can take any victory I can get. Now we get the opposite of the beginning of the episode. Um, Jeff and Abed walk into the study room looking very hungover. And Britta gets to turn it around on Jeff finally. You know, instantly the curse is, is gone. And now she has something over him again and mm-hmm. says... <laughs> You look about ready to marry Courtney Love. <laughs> That's the reverse of my zinger from before. Okay, please stop shouting. All right, I feel like that person in the TV show. I really love Hungover Abed. 
I feel um, like that person in the TV show. <laughs> uh, but I also really like uh, Britta and Jeff's interactions throughout the whole episode, but here especially because it was kind of nice seeing Britta bounce back so quickly. Yeah. Have a seat, drunky Brewster, when <laughs> she asks Jeff if he remembers calling her. And he's like, yeah, but clearly doesn't. Yeah. They get ready to study, and uh, Jeff looks at Abed and is like, I guess things are back to normal now, to which Abed says, movie reference. (laughs) Now we cut to the dance. There's a really f***ing awkward shot. It pans across the dance floor, and it's a bunch of extras doing the same, like, choreographed line dance. Super weird. Took me out of it. <laughs> the human being is in his kissing booth outfit and his dance is pretty funny. He's just waving his waving his hands around. Mm-hmm. Uh and Jeff shows up with flowers. He finds his way through the choreographed dancers to Slater and gives her the flowers. Slater's been trying to get a hold of Jeff for a while, and Jeff's kind of confused. And Slater reveals here they do mention more about their call, uh, that Jeff called Slater thinking he was calling Britta and hung up when he realized it wasn't Britta. And here's the thing about this. Which I get why, when that happens, she wouldn't make a big deal, but she'd be like, well, I guess he's drunk and thinking about that girl. Yeah. And what do you I, think about this? Go ahead. I think that she... I totally get her being upset. Yeah. I just... I just don't get why Jeff wasn't concerned at all going into it, you know? Like, he just assumed, oh, well, things are fine with Britta, so things are fine with Slater. But... You know. I think he likes Slater, but I think because of the loosey-goosey nature of their relationship, I don't think he feels a lot of, I don't know. like That's true. I don't know exactly what it is. A lot of concern. Yeah. I mean, I guess he does, but I feel like he thinks that he just doesn't have to worry about anything. Yeah. Uh, and Slater leaves. Uh, Jeff tries to chase after her, but that was a pretty dickish thing, and she's totally justified to storm off from that. Totally. But even like she does say to him, like Britta did earlier... You know, she wasn't like, we're done. She says, I'll talk to you later. I'm doing this now. Which, you know, shows that she's not, you know, so mad at him that she's ready to end things. But right. he's still in the doghouse, as he says a little later. Jeff has a little joke to try to lighten the mood that doesn't really work. And then he tells her the truth, that Britta drunk dialed him. And it embarrassed her and made her sad. And the only way for her to get her power back was for Jeff to get drunk and leave her an equally embarrassing message, which sounds f***ing crazy when you explain it like that. Yeah. And Slater totally calls him out. It's not, it's, she says, it sounds like you and Britta are friends the same way that my mom's pool cleaner was my uncle. <laughs> which is <laughs> a weird line that gives away a lot about Slater's childhood that's kind of yeah, nice to, to fill in that character just a little bit. Slater is no nonsense. She just asks straight out, did you guys have sex? Jeff says, absolutely not. Truthfully, they haven't. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make sense to Slater. Because Jeff did all this work to make Britta feel a certain way, but then mentions that there was this ice cream that she wanted Jeff to pick up just for them to hang out and watch movies, and he wasn't willing to do that. He is so lax about their relationship, but so invested in Britta. Yeah, it's it speaks volumes. And if I think if, if I were in Slater's situation, I'd be pretty peeved too. Yeah. You know, regardless of what our relationship is, if we're dating... We're dating, ex- like you yeah. and I are dating, yeah. Well, and I get a lot of times when you get in a new relationship, people are carrying the baggage from their previous relationship still, mm-hmm. regardless of how long it's been. So I think that's normal, but usually there's like conversation about it. Yeah. Well, and Jeff and Britta didn't date. There's just like this weird like connection between them. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think Slater's totally justified, and I think you're right that she does it without being too vitriolic you know she she stands up for herself rightfully and not dramatically yeah i think she's totally warranted in her you know i don't think she overreacts to anything here yeah jeff not picking up chubby hubby ice cream for law and order night because it sounds too marriagey yeah how dare you douchebag jeff yeah Uh, absolutely douchebag jeff move and then Slater says, you know what, can we just talk about this later? Because I'm, like, doing my job right now. I have a dance to run, you know? She was having a good time, and Jeff kind of came out up to her all hot, you know? Yeah. Also, every time I watched this scene, when she says, let's talk about this later, all I could think ha. about was this Talk about this later. Yeah. Ha-ha. Ha-ha. 
So now we get that. Okay, it tells me what song it is on the closed captions here. The paparazzi kids going crazy is the <laughs> oh, title of the go. song. Begins playing. I'm what looking about? forward to finding that. And I love both now and later with Pierce and Troy all the shots of Chang dancing. Oh my god! Here he's just getting some glamour shots. He's doing like the bad snap to the side. He's <laughs> got a bottle of like tequila in. He's moving his hips around. He's just really getting at it and then he points at his el tigre chino <laughs> like you know just just yet another excellent dance scene with benjamin franklin chang he in is his truly first season. vibing yeah <laughs> he is he is living his best life with pierce, with a whole bottle of liquor in his hand too it's great pierce and troy ever so slightly edge their way out of the bathroom wearing like flasher cover-ups <laughs> Pierce says, you know, I thought I'd be embarrassed, and now I'm just scared. And Troy <laughs> says rightfully, I'm seriously reconsidering how much I want this credit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Is it really worth it? And they show up. Chang sees them. They begin to take off their their cover-up. Troy says, never let him see us cry. <laughs> Which he doesn't follow very well here in a moment. No. And right before they go to make fools of themselves, Annie and Shirley do the right thing and out themselves. They say they're mm-hmm. the ones who sent the letter. They're willing to <laughs> tell Chang. And Troy first goes, you work at Princeton? <laughs> but they're, the girls are willing to tell Chang what really happened because they don't want their their friends to have to be humiliated any further. Pierce is really mad at them. It's justifiable. Troy feels like they need to be chivalrous towards these women and they can't let them fall on the blow. They feel like the manly thing to do is 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 still go through with it and just dance. Pierce doesn't say that. He's like, oh, we'll just slip out of these pants and <laughs> yeah. give it to the women. Uh, but, you know, Troy says... This whole thing started because... You and I were ashamed that we didn't have ladies that cared about us, and the good news is we obviously do. The bad news is that it makes it our manly duty to protect them tonight. I think this is a little cheesy. Well, I think the real reason why they do this is because, you know, (laughs) Troy knows how good they look in those suits, and he wasn't trying to miss that opportunity. There is that, but I think if Shirley and Annie had told the truth to Chang, I don't know that anything good would have happened to anyone, but I don't think Troy and Pierce would still have to have done what they were about to do. No. And I don't think he would have made Annie and Shirley do anything. No. But Troy decides to be chivalrous and go through with it. Good guy, Troy. They take off their cover-ups and they walk off into the sunset <laughs> to dance with, with Chang. Let's talk about these outfits. Oh, they're phenomenal. So I'll start with Troy. I don't have a picture here, but the image is pretty pretty ingrained in my mind. Troy's um, looking like former first lady hillary bonham clinton oh yeah these, looks these good fine shoulders the, the ascot situation is it a scarf whatever you want to call it looks really nice the blue very it's a solid fit considering that you know these suits are are very clearly not tailored it's a pretty solid fit for troy pierce's shoulder sash is very strange <laughs> pierce a little bit larger uh you know Got to work a little harder to find one for him, but... That's true. You That's know, he's true. he's doing his best. Shirley and Annie are, like, staring off in disgust. And Shirley's like, just look <laughs> away, baby. <laughs> just look away, baby. <laughs> and then they start dancing. Uh, Chang is all about Troy's ass. Yeah. <laughs> Immediately yeah. pulls his ass towards him, and then Troy, like, starts twerking. we got to talk about... We get one of those <laughs> iconic... Troy Donald Glover facial expressions where just instantly he feels so dirty and ashamed but he (laughs) wants to do what's expected of him so he really (laughs) delivers but it's very emotionally taxing on him just like the the look of pain and sorrow in his face as he's twerking is equally funny are Pierce's weird (laughs) <laughs> pseudo dance movements that remind of frank on always what sunny do. doing the like go for it go for it go because <laughs> he's doing similar stuff with his hands <laughs> not a lot to say about it but it's a funny visual uh them in the pantsuits along with chang's whole demeanor in this in this little bit it, it's one of the most memorable parts of the series so far i think it, it's just hilarious any way you look at it definitely next we get britta walking into the dance and I am a betrothed man, so there's not a lot I can say. But wow, I think that Britta is looks lovely. Gillian Jacobs stunning. 
Yeah, I in think this, she looks in beautiful. This scene. And she's here with a motive, and I think it's very funny. And it ties up this this thing very well. Jeff notices her and says, whoa. And Britta's acting all like schoolgirl cutesy that upon first watch of this episode, you're like, what's she doing? Like, what's going on? Literally. Here? You're kind of like, oh, shoot, is she? <laughs> what does she actually think's going on? But of course mm-hmm. she doesn't think. What We'll get, we'll yeah. get through it. Uh, Jeff is like, what are you doing here? And Britta, without batting an eye, she's so devious in this, you know? She's like, You know, when you called me last night and invited me to the dance, I was shocked and thrilled. She says. (laughs) And Jeff just has this look of, oh my God, what am I gonna do? What is this? What do I do with this? And Britta's like, oh, are you okay? You should go watch the scene. Gillian Jacobs plays it off very well, and Joel does too. Yeah, uh, really he immediately flustered. And he doesn't like, I'm sure this is confusing for him in a lot of ways, but he doesn't let it go anywhere it shouldn't. He immediately says like, hey, look, I don't remember asking you to the dance. And I don't remember anything. And mm-hmm. now Slater knows all the drunk dialing stuff and I'm at the doghouse. And if she finds out about this, it's over. Uh, so again, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. And you're messing with me right now, aren't you? <laughs> Right when he's like, oh my god, I've got to break Britta's heart after, like, humiliating her. And Britta kills it here. Says, I knew you didn't remember anything from that phone call last night. You just... (laughs) She got all dressed up just to to make this happen to Jeff. And Britta's like, it's so worth it. But this puts them in a kind of incriminating position when Slater walks up to the two of them. Right as Britta's saying, you're worth it, you know? Yeah. Uh, she walks right past them, and and Jeff says, wait, and Slater rightfully is like, what else is there to say, you know? Mm-hmm. What else is going on here? Jeff doesn't have anything to say, but I think Britta, through Jeff's reaction to what just happened, sees where Jeff's heart is. Yeah. And she bails him out of this after kind of getting him deeper into it just a second ago and plays the beginning of Jeff's voicemail to Britta that he left when he was very intoxicated. And it's all about how he really cares about Slater and he doesn't want to mess it up and he's scared he's going to mess it up and he wants something similar for Britta. And it's sweet. It is. And believable, I think. I think it tracks. I do too because I think at this point, especially Jeff is more invested in his friendship with Britta than anything else, and that's good. But I think Jeff would still hop in the sack if well, absolutely. The, the sack was opened. Yeah. They talk about Abed making a turtle face, and Abed's turtle face being funny because he laughs in the middle of the drunk message about Abed making a turtle face. I would like to see that turtle face. I would, too. This part now, the very end of this wrap-up, is a little bit um, ham-fisted. Mm -hmm. Uh, how Slater just totally drops everything and goes right into Happy Valentine's Day, just like how in their last episode where they had a a fight over Jeff not being able to say that they're boyfriend-girlfriend, and then Mm -hmm. she's like, slams the door on him, and she's like, let's bang, you know? Yeah, I think it's it's very wrap-up-y. But they made the conflict feel earned, so Mm -hmm. it would have been nice if they gave the resolution just an extra second. I also don't buy that, like, right after this happens, while Slater's still there, uh, you know, Britta grabs Jeff by the arm, or chest, and leans into his ear while she's looking beautiful, and whispers, now whispers something harmless that says, well, not super harmless, says that was the first 20 seconds of a 40-minute message that revealed a lot. I'm sure it did reveal a lot, and there probably was some incriminating stuff in it. Oh, absolutely. if I'm Slater who has just had a little bit of a crisis in my relationship because of this girl and her relationship with my boyfriend. And right yeah, after she's explained off. herself to me and everything's okay now, all of a sudden they're like whispering secrets. Yeah, no. Bold move, Cotton. Yeah, I don't think it would have played off as well as it does. I think it's just an excuse for, you know, for a writing, for a, this line to be delivered only to Jeff, but, but yeah. the way it looks is bad. It looks real bad. And right after she leaves, Slater says, Happy Valentine's Day, perfect boyfriend. Yeah, which is a bit of a jump for someone you were just pretty mad at. But really, up until this last moment, everything has worked really well for me. Mm-hmm. There was just one or two moments that we didn't have a ton to say about. I think all of the plot lines work well, wrap yeah. themselves up well, 
intertwine with each other well, and they all include quite a few funny jokes. I think and so, too. there's a moment that leaves things open on the table as Jeff leaves as Mr. Perfect Boyfriend with Slater. He can't help but look behind himself and get one last glimpse at the way Britta looks. Uh, and the thing that catches my eye here is that she's dancing with my boy Troy. And that's where the episode ends. I think that's a little cheesy, the Jeff looking back, but I yeah. think they're doing a great job at showing the complexity of the feelings these two people have for each other. I agree. I and think I don't have much to the... say other than that. We'll just see where it goes from here. This has probably been the episode, so far at least, that I could actually, you know... Get behind take, Jeff and Get Rita. behind their chemistry more so. I, I think agree. that they vibe so well this whole episode. I agree. Now, another thing, I think this show does a lot better when they're like a couple steps away from hooking up than mm-hmm. what it does after they actually do. Yeah. But that's for another day. Let's talk about this end tag. Okay. Uh, it's, it's pretty short and simple. Uh, Troy and Pierce are leaving. I didn't speak much about it. I really like Troy and Pierce having this plot line together in this episode. After mm-hmm. the original idea was for Troy and Pierce to be the buddy of the of the show, of the crew. and it didn't go that direction, here we kind of got a glimpse of what that could have been, and it's a pretty good one. I yeah, like I think I bit. like all the times that they pair them up so far. Even though it hasn't been, you know, the main focus, it's been nice, the little blurbs we've gotten, and I yeah. think this one was a bigger taste of that, and I like it. Yeah, I'm glad that Troy and Abed are the friendship of the show, and I don't think the alternate reality Pierce-Troy version of the show would have been better no. But I like when we get to see them interact because they're both stupid and uh, Pierce, even though he's terrible, he has like an innocence underneath it. And I think the two of them play well off of each other. Totally. They're, they're leaving the dance and Choi's like, man, I can't wait to get out of these outfits. And Pierce is kind of like not really saying much. He's like, yeah, I guess, whatever. And Choi's like, well, what are you doing? I'm parked over here. I can give you a ride home. And Pierce just kind of fumbles, and then it's revealed as Chang pulls up on his moped that <laughs> uh, Chang and Pierce are going home together, or at <laughs> least going to get frozen yogurt. Yeah, that was funny because uh, Pierce is like, "I'm not gay, man." They close in they seven just minutes. They close in seven minutes. <laughs> and then a choice like, "Well, why couldn't I come?" <laughs> and Chang's like, "He said you hated frozen yogurt." Or Troy even says, I could have driven you. We could have all gone. (laughs) And then uh, Pierce is like, just drive. Which makes me think there's more going on between Pierce and Chang than what meets the eye. Listen, at least Pierce is hoping so. And the episode ends. I I don't know if this is improvised or not, but uh, Troy very funnily mimics a a woman scorned and yells, (laughs) Slut! I thought that was hilarious. And then trying to fix his suit and... For the walk of shame home trying to cover up it's like it's almost like he fixes his suit and he's trying to like cover up his cleavage yeah uh, he doesn't want any he's like feeling the dirty eyes on him yeah and that's where this episode ends i think it's a great episode i think it's a solid like b plus tier i agree uh i don't have much negative to say about it i just like it quite a bit i don't either because even if it wasn't you know the most groundbreaking or you know crazy episode i thought it was really well done and really enjoyable Yeah, it's a step above the last couple weeks, Mm -hmm. and this season as a whole, I don't know if it's going to end up at the, like, in my top five, which we'll probably do at the end of this season, but it's only a few steps removed from it so far. Totally. Definitely in the upper half. Yeah, so that being said, do you have an MVP picked out this week? I do have an MVP picked out, and it wasn't a super hard choice for me this week. Um, I do want to give a little honorable mention to Troy because he had so many funny moments in this one. But okay. for me, my MVP is Britta. I think that, you know, after a, a rocky start at the beginning, she was a really good friend to Jeff. And if it weren't for her, Slater would have probably, you know, still been mad at him because she cleared him of, you know, suspicion. I considered choosing Britta, but I'm going to go with my other choice because I feel like we often pick the same person. Mm-hmm. But to say something about Britta, I love how this episode, like, she becomes embarrassed about something. Yeah. And we feel sad for her that she's embarrassed. And then she gets to fix the problem for herself in the end, rather than it being Jeff fixing it for them. You know what I mean? Totally. She gets to, like, have her cake and eat it at the end of the episode and Instead of make Jeff feel like someone. an idiot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to counter that, so we can get some things mixed up in here, I'm going to give my MVP to Abed. Nice. I think he does a great job in the episode. I think 
him and Britta are the two characters that are best represented here. I love mm-hmm. seeing that director side of him, both when he's uh, coaching young Chang or when he's trying to help out Jeff. I like seeing drunk Abed, and I very much like hungover Abed. I think yeah. it was a great Abed episode. And a lot of the episodes lately haven't been great Abed episodes. He's just kind of doing his Abed thing in the background. It's it was true. nice that he was a little bit more in the foreground this time. Totally. So that's I agree. There. I think Abed's a good choice. And yeah, that about wraps it up. I think this was a good episode. I've yeah. said it a couple times. No, I do complaints. too. We're getting closer and closer to some of the like real heavy hitters this season. Yeah, we've got one of them kind of next week. Next week is physical education. Oh, yeah. Uh, the great pool billiards uh, PE episode. So be sure to get in your thoughts and your unanswered trivia questions. Uh, you can send them to us on social media, or you can email us at can'tdisappointpodcast at gmail.com. Get involved with it. I hope you're re-watching with us and having a good time. Yeah, I uh, really have had a lot of fun reading the emails, answering the trivia, and seeing all your tweets and posts guys so keep it up it's a lot of fun for us and if you have any questions or thoughts or concerns feel free to to hit us up hey i actually want to segue really quick to one more kind of serious thing um we were doing it a lot for a second and it's been a long time since we've said out loud black lives matter and yeah you're right it's still just marching on and disappointing things are still happening all the time like worse and worse things and it just like with the pandemic it's just it's getting quieter you're right and we're doing this silly show when you know not that long ago we weren't sure if we should do it because of what was going on Mm -hmm. and it's not like anything isn't going on that's so still we need justice for brianna taylor and so many other people that are becoming hashtags but aren't changing anything absolutely thank you zach please register to vote very important yes please for real for real even if you like no matter what you're voting for like vote because if you don't like the way things are then you know on all sides vote for progressive lawmakers on a local level so we can really like get change exactly so yeah Yeah. that's my white man input on that I think that about wraps it up this week. Uh, Steven, are there any final messages you have for the people? Any words of wisdom for Uh, our loyal Um, listeners? I do, I do. Just uh, for everyone out there, you know, I know times can seem scary, but never forget. What's up? You know, you said... Don't let the thinking get you drinking. Um, Yeah. That's all I got to say. From inside Total Drama Island, uh, I'm Zach. And I'm Gwen from Total Drama Island. Oh, thank God. Yeah, I'm right? down. Wouldn't it be great right. to do a podcast with her instead? Uh, yeah. But I'm Steven. Drunk dial Gwen from Total Drama Island anyway. Done we'll that. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much for listening. Right. Thanks Have for a great watching, week. guys. Bye. Bye, guys. There, nobody's watching yet. I'm watching. Always watching Wazowski. And we're out. Cinnamon buns. Everybody hitting the dance floor. Hit a bass go. Incredible.